Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street partners with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties across Australia and the globe to develop engagement strategies and empower people to organise for change. And in 2021, which is not that far away, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to make a difference, inspire, give hope and enable leadership to achieve their shared purpose. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com. .au. Hello, folks, and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left political and cultural podcast that dives into the progressive issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. Um, we're, I think we're all detoxing from basically five days straight of sitting watching the US election, presidential election coverage. Uh, and m- me, my, myself, I am also trying to detox. So this week's episode, we are not talking about US politics. Um, we're coming home and we're talking uh, about the Australian music industry, in fact. Uh, and on today's episode, we're going to be speaking with Clive Miller. Clive is the chief executive of an organisation called Support Act, which is Australia's only charity that delivers crisis relief services for those working in the entertainment industry. So that includes um, musicians, uh, and their crews and managers and all the support components that go into the music industry. So Clive is coming on today to talk about the work that he and his team are doing at Support Act to provide critical support for our Australian artists in 2020 as um, obviously Corona, well, the restrictions because of Corona has had a direct impact uh, on their livelihood. So that's an interesting conversation with uh, Clive. Uh, don't forget that you can subscribe to Socially Democratic. It's up every Friday at some point in the afternoon when we get around to editing it. And you can download it on your favorite podcast app, uh, Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, you name it. And also to get all the latest updates about the podcast, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Let's get to today's episode. Okay, we're taping this one on a Friday afternoon in Melbourne, and we're actually taking a break from our extensive US election coverage to focus on some issues that are a little bit more local. The Australian music industry was significantly affected by the um, the restrictions placed because of COVID, um, which obviously has directly impacted on artists and their support crews and their livelihoods. Um, and there's an organisation called Support Act, which is an Australian organization that is a charity that delivers crisis relief to services for those working in the entertainment industry and joining me on the line from sydney is the ceo of support act clive miller clive welcome to socially democratic thanks Stephen. nice to be here it's uh i feel talking to someone from sydney for a long time there were, over the last sort of two or three months i've had a number of guests that have been on from outside of victoria and my first question normally was what's life like there right now because we're all living vicariously through you but now our stri- restrictions are starting to get lifted we feel like we're kind of catching up a bit but i'm wondering certainly um before we talk a bit more about your um the work that you do with support act i just want to get a sort of sense about um how your experience has been for uh, uh as a sydney side of living throughout uh, COVID in 2020. I'm, uh, I've been very fond of saying in the last few months that uh, I have been living my life in solidarity with everyone in Melbourne because, uh, to be honest, my routine has not changed since uh, the lockdown period in uh, Sydney and I uh, was always pretty sceptical that uh, suddenly life was going to bounce back to normal. So uh, I have continued, to be honest, to wear my mask. I have uh, continued to limit my social engagements. I take my dog for a walk twice a day. I do my shopping once a week. And uh, to be honest, I have uh, been kept incredibly busy. And uh, you know, I have been grateful, I guess, for the opportunity to uh, put uh, a lot of my time and effort into just uh, doing 
uh, what I can to uh, keep the wheels moving at Support Act. So, you know, life for me has been uh, pretty monastic, <laughs> pretty simple. But, um, you know, I, I, I think like everybody else, it's been an opportunity to just reflect also on, you know, how much, how much unnecessary stuff, you know, mm. we do in life and that we consume and all that running around and everything else. I'm not saying that, you know, we should never have so few interaction with each other, but um, I, I do, um, you know, I have quite enjoyed the fact of uh, just leading a simpler life, I suppose. It's funny that actually, as we, you talk about that, the monastic life, um, as we here in Victoria are slowly coming out of our um, reasonably harsh restrictions that, we've been in, that have been in place for a number of months now, um, and as the bars start to open, um, I think a lot of Victorians, or certainly Melbournians, some of them, are, including myself, are quite tentative in the, we're not running out the door straight away and hitting the local bars and you know having a couple of drinks. Um, I've actually still only, I think I've gone out and had a social drink with someone twice so far. So it's kind of like creeping out because we've just got so used to being stuck inside for such a long period of time. It's quite bizarre. Yeah, well, look, I think I think um, that's always been, you know, at the macro level, that's been the concern that, um, you know, it might take people a while to get comfortable with the idea of, uh, going back into venues and uh, going in, going to see live music, going um, into a theatre environment uh, or whatever. And, and certainly there were surveys, I think, uh, a couple of months ago where people were, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, no, I, you know, absolutely do that. But I guess, I guess um, the proof will be in the pudding. Um, you know, I think if the entertainment's there, ultimately people uh, will go and... Uh, People clearly want to go out to eat and want to go out and kind of get a haircut and we all have to do the shopping and, and things like that. But uh, the pandemic isn't over yet, so it's probably uh, wise that all of us um, are still uh, exercising, exercising a degree of caution. Indeed. Let's, uh, let's talk about Support Act. Uh, just talk a bit about um, the, the history behind why Support Act came about and what, uh, what it actually does in terms of supporting uh, workers in the uh, entertainment industry. Support Act was established in 1997 and it was, um, it took actually surprisingly, I think it took around about 10 years from uh, the germ of the original idea for uh, the organisation to be established. But there was really a strong recognition that there needed to be some kind of um, support structure in place for artists. And I think um, one of the, um, you know, one of the original artists that uh, people might have been uh, thinking about were, um, you know, some of the international artists who had um, had success overseas, come back, you know, the success wanes, and then suddenly, you know, the, the, the lifestyle and the career fall apart and there, there uh, tends to be a bit of a decline you know, a fairly cliched, I suppose, decline into um, substance abuse and, 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 and poverty and a lot of self-destructive behaviour and, and, and ultimately even death. And I think uh, there were uh, a, a number of examples where, to varying degrees, um, that sort of uh, scenario uh, unfolded and people were just saying, really, you know, this is, this is just not, acceptable but that as an industry we need to uh, provide and have some sort of uh, benevolent organization a support act limited was known um, in those days in place to be able to provide uh, support um, and and initially uh, the focus was on financial support um, to people who were doing it tough uh, so the organization proper was formed in 1997 uh, it was granted charity status in uh, 2000 and uh, for the first uh, 18 years I guess um, that uh, the focus was solely on providing what we now refer to as crisis relief so that short-term financial support uh, to people in crisis um, pre-COVID we used to just refer to that as uh, people that were unable to work due to illness or injury or to a mental health issue that was governed by a mental health plan. And uh, what we were able to do is provide, I guess, enough financial support to 
help people be able to kind of just get their breath back, be able to get themselves back on track. And in 70% of cases, people were able to get back into work. Uh, since COVID, we have expanded that to uh, just include, we've recognised financial crisis really as it ended itself. So uh, the fact that so many people have lost their jobs and lost their income, uh, we're uh, now recognising COVID as the crisis and, mm. and so providing uh, financial support for that as well. And then in around about 2018, we uh, established a new service, which is called the Support Act Wellbeing Helpline. And that's a, a free 24-7 phone counselling service, which is available to anyone working in music or the arts who's concerned about any aspect of their mental health uh, or well-being. If you're an artist, um, how do you qualify to get support from Support Act? Um, like, I, is it... Is it do you, like it sounds like it's almost like a union in some respects, but I mean, do you have to be a member or is it like, you know, what's the, what's the standard? I can imagine if John Farnham puts out a really shit album and all of a sudden he's freaking out about it, can he come and see you for some relief? Or is it actually sort of, you know, guys and uh, uh, support acts that are trying to do local kind of pub scene kind of work or how does it work? Well, it's anyone that works in music, um, either as an artist um, or musician uh, or as crew or as uh, a music worker, and that can cover anyone from a band manager through to a journalist, um, photographer, uh, somebody that works in a record company or whatever. So uh, anyone that has worked in the music industry and can demonstrate they've worked in the music industry for three years or more uh, qualifies uh, to be able to apply for a crisis relief grant, provided that their expenditure exceeds their income. So uh, when people apply to us, they do have to provide uh, their annual uh, income and expenditure, which uh, for many people often uh, just in itself is uh, a bit of uh, financial literacy <laughs> kind of training. But, in, you know, I mean, people in the music industry, a lot of them are very used to living off the smell of an oily rag. Uh, it's the ultimate gig economy. People uh, have very insecure financial uh, situations. So, um, uh, but, uh, you know, when, when people do find themselves in that position of crisis where really um, they just can't uh, pay the rent anymore uh, or they've got a big medical bill that they can't pay, uh, a big phone bill, uh, can't get the car registered or, or um, maintained, uh, those sorts of things, then uh, if they come to us, uh, we will uh, assess their application, provide them with some counselling support, but then look at what bills we can pay on their behalf. What's the career cycle of... Uh, the, the the musicians and the and the people working in that industry that um, that you seek to support like uh, just earlier your earlier remarks talking about how like a lot of art you first when you're setting up the organisation you notice that a lot of artists that would go over to the United States or go overseas and do quite well and then come home and then all of a sudden find their career floundering a little bit it kind of feels like. Um, and I'm a bit of a sports uh, nut, so I look at it sort of like a, a, someone who's playing an elite level of sport gets those sort of their careers like six or seven, eight, maybe nine, ten years of doing quite well, but then that's it. And certainly what we're seeing in the United States is a lot of those athletes that are getting ridiculous amounts of money can't make that money last for the rest of their career after they're, they're, they've finished playing in that particular sport. Is there a longevity to or is there a plan there for you guys to support the artists to make things last longer or do they do they just shine and then that sort of that star burns out? How do, what do you see in terms of uh, the career span of some of the people you support? Well, look, I think the, um, the analogy you've drawn there to sport is actually really a good one. And we've studied and spoken to people uh, who work uh, with the AFL Players Association, particularly in relation to mental health, and uh, looked at what they do in terms of providing mentoring support to um, a lot of the young players. And they do have programs in place whereby uh, they, they start to mentor 
uh, young players um, literally from the get-go and start to get them thinking about what life is going to be like once they stop playing. And I guess um, if you're a footballer, uh, there's, a, there's a recognition that, that there's going to be uh, a finite um, career span uh, where you, when you're actually going to be able to play football. Um, you know, people in the music industry perhaps are, uh, are not quite as, um, uh, well, some anyway, I mean, I guess everyone comes in with big dreams and wants to think that they're going to still be incredibly famous and playing music uh, like, you know, Jimmy Barnes or, uh, or you know, somebody else that's had just a really incredible career. But... Um, but uh, I, I think that our learning from all of that is that something similar uh, would really benefit people in the music industry as well. And that's one of our goals, um, to actually uh, put in place, um, I guess, a series of programs. And this is, you know, for us, um, we see this more on the kind of mental health uh, side of uh, our programming. But you know, to be able to put in... Um, a, a, a series of programs uh, and, and, uh, edu- and develop sort of education materials and resources that, um, that uh, provide mentoring support to people, that um, help them uh, plan uh, their careers uh, and, and for life perhaps after a career, to help to ensure that while they're having their career that um, they're uh, that they're managing their mental and their physical health um, in the best way possible, and 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 in fact, you know, perhaps to start thinking themselves of themselves more like uh, elite athletes, um, so that you know, just recognizing that um, you know, peak performance comes when people are at their best mentally and physically. So, I guess ideally, you know, that's that's um, you know the kind of uh, contribution that uh, we uh, see ourselves as being able to make over the years to come. The, uh, I assume then in order to, to provide this critical support to these, to these artists uh, and support workers in the industry, the philanthropic component to your organisation must be incredibly important. Talk us through um, the, 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 the strategy there. Well, uh you know, it absolutely is. Like uh, any organisation, um, we rely on uh, the support that we get from uh, from the community at large, and um, to some extent, our government. Uh, we uh, we received support from the Australian government this year, which was uh, which was just incredibly uh, well received and uh, and uh, incredibly. Uh, I guess, integral to our ability to provide the level of support that we have uh, provided over the last uh, sort of six to seven months um, in in terms of our COVID response. But um, equally important has been the support that we receive from industry. Uh, So uh, we have our founding partners who are uh, APRA AMCOS and RAPPCA. Uh, We have support from most of the major record companies. We've had incredible support from a lot of artists um, this year. The Hilltop Hoods have done um, fantastic stuff for us. Vanessa Amorossi, uh, Powderfinger, and uh, Kate Sobrano, and, and others. Um, and, and then, of course, um, people uh, who listen to music and love music. And, and I think that's been the really... Um, the most incredible thing in some ways over the last uh, six months or so has been the support that we've received from people who have just recognised uh, the impact that uh, COVID is having on uh, people, um, people's income and uh, career paths that work in uh, the music industry, recognising that everything stopped, that uh, they lost all of their income. And, uh, of course, they're driven by the fact that, uh, you know, they miss live music and they want to be able to go out and, and listen um, to their favourite band again and just kind of participate, uh, enjoy the music and, and, and participate in that social environment. So um, we have had enormous support from uh, music lovers 
uh, is how I would refer to them. And uh, I think that's been enormously gratifying for us, but I know it has been for uh, the artists and crew and music uh, workers that we support as well. Just knowing that there's that love out there in the community is uh, has been really wonderful. Um, it's interesting because my follow-up question was, it, do you find any artists that have obviously clearly made it um, give back to uh, their industry um, in any way? And you just named uh, the Hilltop Hoods and um, um, Powderfinger and a couple of others. What, what, what ways have they provided support to the work that you guys are doing in, uh, in 2020? Yeah, and look, that list is not exhaustive, you know, by by any means. Um, I, I guess I highlighted them because uh, Powderfinger did an incredible uh, concert in May. Um, I think it was their first concert in um, 20 years or something, and uh, they um, they uh, turned it into a fundraiser for us and Beyond Blue and uh, just raised an incredible amount of money. So uh, that was really fantastic. Um, Hilltop Hoods and Vanessa Amorossi have done uh, singles for us where they have donated all the proceeds and um, they've done well. We were the beneficiaries of music from the home front, the, uh, that great concert that uh, Mushroom Music and Michael Kudinski organised uh, in April. So many artists uh, just talk us up and uh, promote us, um, you know, to their fans and yeah so so you know i think i think you know what's what's been really great for us is that uh, people acknowledge the important role um that we play the work that we do and and i guess just the need for there to be an organization like support act so um i think we've been uh, I, I mean i think we were always highly regarded but it, it feels like the organization has been really you know very warmly um, embraced uh, by uh, the industry over um, the last six months in particular. And I guess that's largely because we've been able to do so much in terms of the crisis relief we're providing, uh, the mental health services. Um, and uh, one of the other things that uh, I guess, or some of the other things that we're doing in that area um, have been to uh, provide mental health first aid training uh, to people in the industry. So as a way of really, it's really um, not only giving people some, some, some concrete sort of tools to help them understand the signs and symptoms of uh, common mental health issues, the language that uh, they uh, can use uh, if they need to talk to uh, somebody, a, a work colleague or a band member or um, if it's their manager, maybe to their artist, um, if, if they have concerns about uh, someone's mental health, if they, if they have concerns about their own, uh, how to make referrals and all of that kind of stuff. So um, it's been, uh, that's been a really, really uh, important uh, undertaking. And uh, I think it's uh, one of the other real benefits there has been that it's really helped to destigmatize dis um, the whole issue of mental health, which is, um, so often, you know, the biggest problem that people won't, or, or you know, some people are just reluctant to talk about um, their, their their own mental health, uh, let alone ask for any help. So, uh, the mental health first aid training that we've been doing with um, the Association of Artists Managers, uh, with Apple Amcos um, and artists, and uh, another organisation we partner with is called Crew Care, and uh, their members are my production crew. Uh, that's been, I guess, uh, uh, you know, that's been really rewarding just to see uh, just the impact of those programs and sort of back to your initial question, I guess it's, you know, it's a fairly symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. that, um, that uh, not only the people, I guess, uh, recognise the importance of the organisation and what we do, but the fact that we're able to be able to, I think, you know, give so much back just at the moment um, is, uh, has been beneficial for everybody. When uh, it's, it's Hogmanay 2020, the bells ding, new, a new year starts, a new decade, and you come back into work uh, in the, you know, the, the days following, and you're going, right, okay, new year, and we sort of think about our strategy for, for 2020 and what we're going to do, and then COVID happens. 
um, which completely alters the landscape. Um, what did you guys do from a strategic standpoint to work out where you could be best placed to support uh, people in your industry? Because I just feel like it would be like a tsunami coming towards you the minute that the, the economy shut down because of all of the restrictions put in place at a national level. Yeah, and look, it was um, you know it was a scary moment for us as it was for everybody else. And um, to be honest, at first uh, we just had to uh, pull up the drawbridge and, and say, you know, we just have to hang on a minute. We we actually have to raise some money here before we can <laughs> actually disperse money. It's you know we're a small organisation. It's not like we have a huge amount of reserves or anything like that. So. Um, you know, and that was um, that was you know that was difficult for for us in the sense that uh, you know people were obviously turning to us and uh, we 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 were just having to hold them off for a little while, um, but we always knew that what we um, you know what people would need would be crisis relief that they would need some sort of financial support. Uh, the concern for us, I guess, was always well, how long is the pandemic going to go for? <laughs> and, mm. Uh, where, you know, our, our uh, usual modus operandi um, is to just provide short-term uh, uh, financial support to people. So uh, we had to, you know, we had to sort of rethink our model a little bit, not too much, but uh, we certainly made adjustments to make it easier uh, for people to apply. Uh, and then we always knew equally that um, mental health would be uh, in, incredibly important. Uh, so having the helpline in place was uh, a great resource, but then we, we, we knew that we would want to do more. Uh, as I mentioned previously, we were, uh, we were very lucky because there was a lot of dialogue, um, as I think um, all industries were having with the federal government at that point. And, uh, and uh, one of the results of that or one of the outcomes was that Support Act was given a grant of $10 million um, from the Australian government through the Office for the Arts. And so that has really kind of underpinned uh, a lot of what uh, we wanted to do. So, uh, so that, that, that's, you know, I mean, that's been really helpful and it's actually helped us to um, deliver um, I think um, you know a pretty a pretty good um, a pretty good array of services. Originally, I was going to ask you a question about the importance of JobKeeper in in providing um, ongoing financial support for the, um, people in your industry. But as I think about that question, um, and I'm not I'm not I'm not across the requirements for JobKeeper completely, but I would imagine there would be some people that would fall through the cracks or would not be eligible for JobKeeper that work in the music industry. Was that is that something you found? Like, it was it a did it give support to everyone, or were there people coming to you going, "No, I don't actually qualify for this, so I'm still in in some financial um, difficulties here." Look, I I have to give um, credit where credit is due. JobKeeper and JobSeeker have been the safety net that I think have kept. Uh, so many people alive um, in the music industry and no doubt elsewhere. Um, it, it, it's been incredibly important. In the early, um, you know, I suppose in the, in the first few weeks of, of, of May, and I can't quite remember now, but certainly in May and probably June, people were applying to us who had yet to uh, be told whether they would qualify for JobKeeper and JobSeeker. There was, you know, there was a bit of delay, particularly I think with JobKeeper. Um, but these days, pretty much uh, everybody who can um, access those benefits um, is on them, and uh, they have been uh, incredibly important. Uh, obviously, with um, some of the reductions to the coronavirus supplement and, and just reductions in the amount of the benefits and things, we're, we're, we're starting to see. Uh, the impact of that, um, you know, there, 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 there are still people that fall through the cracks, people that, um, you know, people that perhaps, you know, haven't had their taxes up to date, um, have had, you know, just have a certain reluctance about uh, participating in, 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 in mainstream society. They, they, they used to be, I think, to, to kind of living in the margins. And so, you know, I think I still think even today there's, there's probably numbers of people who are not taking full advantage of, um, of uh, 
all of the support that is available. But um, I think the other group that I would identify as having, uh, interestingly, no support are the Australian artists who are overseas and trying to make it overseas. And, you know, there's quite a lot of Australian artists living in Nashville, for example, or in Los Angeles or in New York. And, you know, they've, they've, you know, they've been getting along sort of fairly well until all of the work dried up mm. and they've found themselves um, in a situation where they don't qualify for uh, JobKeeper and uh, they're not going to receive any benefits in the country where they're currently residing, even if they've been paying tax and doing other things. Um, and so, um, you know, they're, they're probably the biggest group, actually, that, um, that have come to us because they have nowhere else to go. Um, we've seen certainly here in Victoria in the most recent weeks since the restrictions began to lift, there's a sort of creativity amongst folks in the hospitality industry to work out how they can continue to or kick their start, kickstart their businesses again in this sort of weird COVID environment that we're in, so outdoor dining and um, taking advantage of um, changes to licensing laws and the like. Is there a – obviously there's been a harsh restriction – imposed on the entertainment industry with live venues and festivals and the like have we seen uh early signs of that creativity in terms of ideas and ways in which we can get around that so people can still enjoy live music but also be safe um whilst we eventually hopefully find a vaccine and move out of this phase in history um and 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 also this follow-up question there is it has been a lot of help given to you financially from uh, from state or federal governments to to embrace this creativity to ensure the arts can get out, back out there and perform? Well, that's really not part of our remit. So there are other organisations that uh, I guess are engaging with government around all of that stuff and there are people like the Australian Live Music Business Council and um, another organisation called uh, LEIF, L-E-I-F, and uh, I... I can't off the top of my head tell you what that acronym stands for. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're, they're the, you know, they're very much the, the promoters and, and the big venue operators and stuff like that. So they're, uh, or the, uh, the, the Live Music Business Council probably represents some of the smaller venues and, and booking agents and stuff like that. So, you know, they're, they're the ones having those sorts of uh, discussions with government. But... I think what we are starting to see is that uh, people are going back into venues, certainly in uh, New South Wales. Uh, we're starting to see um, uh, shows uh, being performed. In fact, uh, the state government here has just sponsored um, ARIA uh, PPCA to deliver a series of, uh, I think it's a thousand concerts over November called Great Southern Nights. And um, and uh, but what people are having to do is just uh, you know obviously they're not uh, they're not um, they're not going to be uh, standing room only you know completely packed out venues um, they all have to abide by um, varying uh, sort of restrictions but uh, I think uh, people are happy enough to do that it's certainly getting people back into work people out there playing again um, engaging with their fans uh, seeing their colleagues uh, just. Uh, I think on every level, everybody's just been um, ecstatic uh, to be able to do that again. And I think um, with uh, some of the shows and some of the sit-down shows, uh, what we're seeing is that uh, people, are uh, they don't just do one show. They might have to do, you know, two or three or four shows over the course of an afternoon um, and an evening uh, to perhaps... Uh, make the same amount of money or, or get the same numbers of people uh, in through the door. But uh, as I said, I think that um, people, you know, the joy of just being able to get out and do something uh, is certainly outweighing uh, any any sort of major concerns about that, I think, just at this point. Yeah, I hadn't considered that. Uh, social distancing does somewhat put a, uh, a, a dampener on the concept of a mosh pit, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, 
In fact, um, I was looking at uh, a photo yesterday of an organisation that's doing a fundraising event for us and they're doing it uh, at a venue in Queensland and uh, the guy put a photo of the venue on the screen which was literally taken from the back of the venue. It was just completely packed out and I must admit it was like, you know, like gee, that's novel, imagine that, you know, like, <laughs> isn't that great? And, of course, uh, the, what he, the, the narrative that came with that was that for the you know for the, the show that they were talking about that it would be table service there would be food that there would everybody would be spaced you know accordingly and you know and a, a finite number of people in the venue and all of that stuff but I think people are happy enough to adapt and uh, as long as as long as things are feeling like they're getting better and the news is getting better the fact that Melbourne's come out of lockdown the fact that uh, you know there is now talk of a vaccine that might be available at some early part of uh, 2021. I think it just, and the fact that, you know, there's it just, and that there are shows being undertaken already, I think it just uh, makes everybody feel a little bit more confident about the future and that it might be closer than uh, we might have thought a month or two ago, for example. The, uh, the only thing they need is that if they, if they can embrace the concept of social distancing at live uh, music events, then hopefully at some stage too, they'll be able to f- um, finally fix that thing that's been undermining us in terms of um, aud- audience uh, viewing uh, at all concerts, which is uh, tall people to the back, short people to the front. Maybe we could all s- fix that up as well whilst we're at it. Well, look, as a taller person, uh, I must admit, I'd gravitate to the back of the room, A, because I feel safer, but B, because uh, there's nothing worse than feeling that you're, you know, blocking somebody uh, who's standing behind you. And uh, so, but yes, I know what you mean. It's a, it's a perennial problem, not one easily <laughs> solved except through seating. <laughs> exactly, seating. But then again, that's not as much fun. Um, singer-songwriter Jenny Morris, uh, millennials look her up, she's a big name, uh, addressed the national press conference in August this year. Did you want to give us a bit of an overview of her remarks when she talked a bit about the sort of future of the Australian uh, music industry? Yeah, well, look, I, I, I um, you know, I thought it was a really uh, great speech and uh, great that uh, she took uh, the stage at the press club, the National Press Club in Canberra. And I mean, she, she was talking about uh, a number of things. Firstly, just the importance of uh, Australian music, um, I guess, as an export product. The fact that, uh, you know, Australian music has evolved over the years to the point now where uh, so many Australians actually do achieve success um, internationally through their music. And I know that, um, uh, you know, she's keen uh, as the industry is in general for, uh, for the government to recognise that and, and to support that. Um, uh, I think uh, probably she would have made um, some, some comments about just the importance of music education. And uh, again, you can't have uh, internationally famous artists if uh, there aren't the pathways in place for uh, for. Uh, for young people to, to kind of learn their craft. Uh, so she was making, I think, some some important comments there. And um, also I think around, you know, venues, the fact that, um, uh, you know, there have in, in, in different states been uh, some quite, uh, you know, some quite draconian um, restrictions, I think, placed on some venues, which, you know, clearly, um, uh, I don't think Jenny... Uh, and, and, and probably a number of other people think, you know, really do much to, to, to promote live music um, at the local level. And, uh, you know, it's it, it sort of, it feels almost like ancient history and hopefully it'll change once um, once we get through COVID. But I think in, in New South Wales in particular, um, you know, there was, um, you know, there have been quite a lot of, uh, you know, there have been the lockout laws and all of the other things here that have, um 
you know, made it harder for for people to uh, to play live in um, in as many venues as perhaps they used to. So I think Jenny's comments, um, you know, were very considered and part of a really important dialogue that um, that uh, the industry needs to maintain with government and uh, with the community at large, just about uh, the role that music plays. Um, in our lives, in our cultural lives, in our social lives, in our uh, economic lives, and um, just uh, just that um, you know, music you know is one of the art forms is actually um, a really important one, <laughs> and that's sometimes overlooked. Um, it's actually funny we've spent thirty odd minutes talking about music, and I've actually not asked you um, what kind of music you like, which is normally like the first question you probably should ask anyone when we talk about music. What what music are you into, by the way? Uh, oh, well, look, I have um, pretty broad taste in music. I uh, started my life working in the independent music scene in, um, uh, well, actually, I, I went to university in Canberra. So uh, I was uh, involved uh, initially with um, live music in Canberra. Uh, then I came to Sydney. I uh, managed a band called The Go-Betweens for a while, um, another band called Ups and Downs. So I was very much part of that um, early 80s uh, independent music scene in Australia. Uh, I've always, uh, I guess, loved, uh, you know, I think I, 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 I certainly uh, can listen to almost uh, everything uh, these days. I will, I will confess publicly that I do have a bit of a passion for uh, music theatre. Uh, so uh, that's, um, you know, that's not always Australian music, but uh, that's certainly something that uh, I, I greatly enjoy. Uh, but yeah, I like to think of my taste as being suitably Catholic. <laughs> Very good. And I just like how you suddenly just drop it. I don't, you know, I managed a band called the Go Betweens there. Um, legends of Australian music. Um, remember about two or three years ago, there was that big debate in the newspaper about what city was the streets of your town actually about, whether it was about Sydney or, or Brisbane. I don't think anyone ever finally put a, um, a, a definitive, gave a definitive answer on that one. Do you care to sort of weigh into that debate or is that, is that something you will never touch? Oh, no, uh, actually, I, I, I'd, I'd always thought it was about Brisbane. Um, but... Um, uh, you know, I, I would have to, um, uh, well, I, I don't know if you know, Lindy Morrison is our national welfare coordinator. I could ask Lindy or I could ask Amanda, I suppose. But uh, given that the song was probably written by uh, Grant and it may have been written to Amanda, it could equally have been about Sydney. So um, there you go. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's your favourite go-betweens uh, song from their catalogue? Uh, gee... I haven't thought about uh, that for a very long time. I'd, I'd have to name um, a few. I mean, you know, from my era, of course, Cattle and Kane was the song that I was most involved with. Um, and uh, one of my early successes was getting that onto Countdown, which in the early 80s was uh, a really big deal. Um, I'd always loved Head Full of Steam, which um, uh, was off uh, one of... Uh, uh, I'm mean, going to forget uh, which album it was off now. But uh, anyway, it was uh, of that time. And uh, then, look, I, you know, I mean, to be honest, I'm a bit of a fan, so I like a lot of them. And then uh, I loved um, Streets of Your Town. And uh, I'm just trying to think of, um, you know, there were a couple of uh, singles on uh, 16, or not singles, but uh, I think I loved all of 16 Lovers Lane. So, yeah, it's an excellent album. I, I think they're a great band. Still, <laughs> still, uh, I actually, for some reason, I've had some sort of nostalgia for Countdown recently. Um, you know, I'm Gen X, grew up as a kid, sun, Sunday nights on the couch after you, your mum and dad, had, you know, thrown you in the bath and then ripped you back out again and fed you and then you're allowed to stay up and watch Countdown. It's something that I kind of, um, I think that m the new generations of, and I know that people can cons consume their music in so many different ways and I'm showing my age here saying it's a shame they never got to have Countdown, but Countdown was such an institution for my generation in seeing both local acts, but also, you know, touring bands. I, I think I've been listening to a lot of Tears for Fears lately. And I just remember when Tears for Fears were first on Countdown, I thought it was one of the greatest things of my life, uh, which sounds just ridiculous now, but at the time it was huge news. I really do miss Countdown. Yeah, well, look, you can watch The Sound now on, um, on uh, ABC at six o'clock and uh, on a Sunday, which uh, is also well worth watching. 
<laughs> Indeed. Last yeah, question before, before we uh, last question before we uh, let you go. Uh, actually, more of an opportunity to give you a bit of a plug. I, I know you got your Rose Music uh, shirt uh, on there. I know this is only audio, this is only audio medium, but just talk us a bit about um, this is Oz Music Music Month um, and the importance of that is to, to the industry uh, going forward. Yeah. Well, look, Oz Music Month is um, uh, a really important. Uh, month, I think, in the uh, Australian music calendar, uh, time to celebrate Australian music and for Support Act, uh, it's uh, even more important because uh, we get to run a major fundraising event, uh, our major fundraising event for the year called Oz Music T-Shirt Day. And that's where we encourage everyone to wear their favourite Oz Music T-shirt on Friday, the 20th of November. And uh, if they're in a position to do so, to make a donation uh, to Support Act, uh, to support uh, the work that we're doing. And for anyone who is interested, if they want to check out our website at ozmusictshirtday.org.au, uh, you can find out how you can participate if you would like to, if you want to set up a team and raise some money and get your friends and family and networks on board. Um, or if you want to make a donation to an existing team, you'll see uh, some pretty cool teams uh, listed on our leaderboard. Um, or you can just make a donation to the campaign. But it's, uh, it's a fun day. It's worth watching on the day um, just to see... Um, you know, who's, who's raising the most money. It's a bit of a uh, friendly competition. Uh, uh, you'll see a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, artists and a lot of companies from within the music industry, but then a lot of other people who are uh, supporters of the industry as well. So definitely um, uh, we hope that, uh, you know, over the years uh, it's going to become uh, bigger and bigger and that uh, we're going to see everybody across Australia wearing an Australian Music T-shirt day on Oz Music T-shirt day um, and uh, we can uh, we can uh, get well we'll get the ball rolling um, next Friday it's uh, the third year we've done it um, in its current form and uh, we uh, we would uh, welcome everyone's support and participation in the day. Fantastic. And we'll put the links to uh, those, um, those uh, websites that Clive just mentioned in the, um, in the description for this week's episode. Uh, Clive Miller from Support Act, thank you very much for your time today coming on the show and talking a bit about some of the challenges that industries face. You do great work and uh, we wish you, wish you the best of success going forward in 2021. Stephen, thank you very, thank you very much. 